Hi everyone, this is the uh, exam review for chapters 13 through the end of the book, chapter 16 or the epilogue. Um, and this one will go pretty quickly because uh, it's relatively recent. Um, we've just finished these chapters and so uh, it needs probably less review than the other ones do. Um, in chapter 13, um, it starts out by talking about um, Erickson's, or at least in the study guide, um, Erickson's theory um, in middle adulthood through the end of life. Um, and that would be uh, intimacy versus isolation, the idea that people want to um, think about, if they don't form a, a partnership with somebody, at least think about that and decide what they want for themselves in adulthood. Um, so intimacy versus isolation. Um, then as people start to get older and they have more resources, they have more time and they're more stable in their lives and in their careers, um, generativity becomes more important. So the importance of community and family and giving back at work and um, doing things that um, help people other than yourselves. Um, and then um, towards the end of life, and they talk about this again in chapter 15, um, the idea of generativity, um, that, uh, excuse me, integrity. Um, when you look back on your life, um, did it have meaning? Um, and did it have the meaning that you wanted it to have? Um, so that's um, Erickson's psychosocial theory towards the end of life. Um, uh, in this chapter, they also talk about personality and personality development. Um, most personality traits are stable across adulthood. Um, that's sort of that's the definition of personality. If it's not stable across person across uh, situations, then it doesn't meet the criteria for being your personality. Um, having said that, um, there are a couple of things that tend to go up a little bit as we get older, um, and that would be agreeableness and conscientiousness. Um, the other ones um, remain more stable or might decline just a little bit. Um, and in the case of neuroticism, that wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, but we tend to retain our rank order um, or some level of rank order stability. Um, so if you were high, moderate, or low um, on, on any of those personality traits earlier in your adult life, you would continue to be in that position relative to the people, to the people around you uh, later in life. So you don't dramatically change to some other category. Everyone is changing along with you. Um, Sternberg's triangular theory of love. I have another video on that that I posted um, in the chapter 13 materials, and so I'm not going to go over that one again. Um, but you know, I think it's important to know uh, the one that I find the most difficult to remember is fatuous love, and that um, is because it's a word that I don't typically use in any other context. Um, and that's that idea that people are getting into something too quickly. Um, they don't know each other very well, um, and yet they form some sort of a long-term commitment um, and have some level of physical passion for each other. Um, and then largely um, the rest of that, uh, the items on the study guide for chapter 13 are um, definitions, and so I'll leave that to you. And for chapter 14, um, when you think about ageism and elder speak, remember that uh, elder speak can, and ageism, not ageism, but elder speak um, can be well-intentioned. It's a benevolent thing, um, but, uh, but the effect is just like stereotype threat. So you're reminding people how old they are. If you say young lady to somebody who is in their 70s um, or young man to somebody who is in their 70s or 80s, um, it's not a compliment. It might be intended as a compliment, um, but the effect of that on the person is to remind them that they're old, that they're older than the person that's talking to them, and that they are perceived as being something other than, uh, than just a person. Um, that, that, that. And so then um, the stereotype is activated and it influences their behavior. So um, that's just something to keep in mind in your own careers and in your own personal lives, um, being conscious of reminding people of, of that attribute. Um, elder speak is very much like um, child-directed speech, and so we talked about that earlier in the semester, um, that sing-song voice, and um, uh, you tend to talk louder to older people um, with the assumption that they can't hear you, and maybe that's true, um, but elder speak has some qualities that are similar to um, child-directed speech. Um, the Hayflick limit. Um, the Hayflick limit is one of the explanations for senescence, for biological aging, um, and that uh, is the idea that um, when your cells are replicating, they can only replicate uh, copies of themselves a certain number of times. And so when that limit has been reached, which is around 50, um, they can't replicate anymore and those cells die and they, don't, they, they aren't regenerated. Um, and the reason that that happens is, and it was discovered by Hayfleck, is that at the end of your cell there's a telomere, or at the end of the DNA there's a telomere, and each time the cell replicates that gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And that's sort of the code at the end that says, hey, you've reached the end. Um, and when that gets to be a critical level of shortness, um, the cell won't replicate anymore because it might risk creating a damaged copy of itself, and cells don't want to do that. Um, the only cells that appear to be immortal are cancer cells. Um, they don't have that quality, but the rest of our cells have that quality, and there's, so there's a limit on how many times they can replicate. Um, 
socio, uh, excuse me, selective optimization with compensation, um, the theory of Paul Balt is a theory of successful aging uh, where we compensate for things that we can no longer do and optimize the things that we can do um, and, and in the context of that, uh, we are more happy, we're more uh, satisfied with our lives. So somebody who might have been perhaps a gymnast earlier in their life um, and things wear out, uh, so perhaps they can't do those uh, vaults or jumps or twists or some of the things that they used to do and used to enjoy doing. And so they may select another sport or they may do more floor exercises rather than more jumping things or, or they may coach rather than um, doing it themselves or, or take on another sport altogether. So they optimize the things that they still can do and enjoy doing um, to compensate for things that they can no longer do because of aging. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about in, uh, in Chapter 14 is uh, polypharmacy. And when you think about um, any prescription that you've ever had for a prescription drug, um, you might have had one or two at the same time. And, and for some people they have more because they have health conditions. But as people get older, they're more likely to have chronic conditions and there's a layering of, uh, of uh, prescription drugs. So somebody might be taking a prescription drug for cholesterol and another one for um, uh, it's escaping me right now. Um, another one for arthritis, um, another one for um, heart, uh, you know, for heart disease, um, any number of things. But those things can be layered on top of each other um, and have drug interactions. So somebody may present as having dementia, and one of the questions they may ask is, what are the medications that the person is on? And they may try and step down um, some of those to see whether there are drug interactions. Um, because there are known drug interactions, but then there are also um, you, know, you can't know all of the things that somebody could be taking in addition to the metabolism of the person that's taking them. Um, so the idea that these things are layered together is called polypharmacy. Um, and then in chapter 15, um, there's a new theory of successful aging called socio-emotional selectivity theory, and that's the theory of Laura Karstensen. And it's the idea that um, we narrow our social circles not as a process of disengagement with the world um, late in life, but because when we view time as limited, uh, we want to maximize the, uh, the, the value to ourselves of the relationships that we have. And so we don't want to engage in a lot of peripheral relationships. What we want is to concentrate on the ones that are really important to us. Um, those give us um, a positive feeling. It doesn't mean that they always make us happy. And, you know, we can have complicated friends or complicated relatives that are still important to us, even if sometimes they drive us crazy. Um, so it isn't just about being smiley all the time, but um, engaging in relationships that are meaningful when you view your time as limited. Um, activity theory versus continuity theory. Um, your book talks about activity theory. Um, one of the things that we've learned about successful aging is activity for activity's sake is not a, a component of successful aging. Activity and being able to continue to do the things that you like to do at the rate that you like to do them is important. So um, it's not a great idea to just try and sign up an elderly person for absolutely everything, but rather to interview them and say, what is it that they liked to do? And if they liked you know, uh, you know, sort of a balance between um, being outgoing and having more solitary activities, then the ability to have that balance in late life is, is um, associated with successful aging. Um, ADLs and IADLs, um, ADLs are activities of daily living, just things that you need to be able to do to survive. Take a bath, get up, go to the bathroom, get back into a chair, get back into bed. Um, those are very basic. The IADLs are the instrumental activities of daily living, and that tells you whether or not the person can live independently. So when you're trying to make a decision for um, a family member or for a patient or for somebody that you work with or, or know, um, the IADL, IADL checklist um, helps us to understand, can the person live independently? Um, can they prepare their own meals? Can they go shopping? Can they get to the doctor's office? Can they make and answer a telephone call? Those kinds of things. Um, uh, when you think of IADL, think of the I as independent, even though it stands for instrumental. Um, and then NORCs, NORCs, um, are naturally occurring retirement communities. Um, in some neighborhoods where people tend to have tended to stay in the same place, as people age up, it becomes a retirement community because all of the people around you may also be aging with you. And so if you all moved in when you were in your 30s or 40s, now that you're in your 70s or 80s, you're all still there. And to the extent that you can stay there, it becomes a retirement community, even though it was not planned that way. Um, and then the last chapter 
Um, you know, we've just talked about that, so I don't feel like that needs a long review. Um, just keep in mind with Kubler-Ross's stages um, that she had a she had a tremendous impact on the field of thanatology, of thinking about death and and talking about how people deal with it and accept it or or don't accept it. But that those stages aren't universal. Not everybody goes through them. Um, even if they do go through them, they don't all go through them in that order. That's a hypothetical order, um, and it makes for a good conversation, a good way to talk to people about things. Um, but what we, what we don't want anyone to do is say, hey, if you haven't gotten angry yet, you're not going to be able to accept your own death or your own impending death until you get angry. That's absolutely not the case, and there's no research evidence for that. Um, so that wraps up the last few chapters. I hope this is helpful. Um, good luck on your test, and uh, good luck wrapping up uh, the rest of your semester. Thanks. Bye.